So uh, first off, what a treat. My husband grew up in South London, too, so I heard a lot. He grew up in Clapham when Clapham was very poor. So I think I understand a little bit of where you're from. I've visited there many times. So I've co-founded or founded four companies now. But that's sort of not all I've done. I've had many different jobs through my career. I was a university professor a couple times, even at MIT. I've been an executive at a couple of big tech companies. And I even worked as an artist for a couple of years, making my living that way. So I've worked over the years quite globally on six continents. I've lived on four of them extensively. And right now, I live in two continents at the same time, um, pan-Pacific, 15 time zones apart between Taipei and Silicon Valley, where I run um, my current company. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about you know, how I got here, why I studied engineering. It's the last thing I thought I would study. I really loved growing up math and art. That's, those are the two things I really loved. And when I was applying for colleges, and I think you guys are about to start that sort of role, uh, that, that step, I really wanted to go to a really good liberal arts college because I didn't, I wanted good math and some good technology, but I really wanted to do art and liberal arts. And so I ended up going to uh, Brown University and really there made my first hologram. And for me, I, I just fell in love with holography, which is this thing you do with lasers. You make 3D photographs, and it was magical. And from the tech side, I wanted to understand everything I could about how that worked. And then also from the art side and the liberal arts side, sort of what we could do with this new kind of medium. So what I found, my path was really a strong grounding in the humanities while I was doing this tech geek stuff. Um, and because I, I felt very deeply looking at the history that really you think the humanities change, cause social change, but really these days social change really comes from technology. It sounds kind of crazy, but if you think of it, the telegraph, you know, if we look back in history, or the radio, or the TV, antibiotics, the pill, contraception completely changed women's rights globally, transformed it, and that was through technology. And so the reason I've done all these startups, I was actually never at all interested in business, at all, or, or the money. The idea that you would pick what you do based on how much money you'd make, it never occurred to me at all, <laughs> still doesn't. Um, but where I think is very clearly the most impactful social change today is happening through the technology founders that are very successful. And so if you want to change the world, a great way to do, about, do that, to think about that, is through an entrepreneurial effort in a high-tech company. And to get there, you need a grounding in the technology, not just the technology. You can't just do technology. You need to focus on social responsibility at the same time. And then, then it's very easy to start a company. Management becomes easy because there's a cause. And everyone in your team, everybody you work with, sort of joins up with you and finds you because they want to move that cause forward. And they'll work harder and go with less sleep than you ever imagined. They won't do that for a normal product. So this was central to my thinking in, I got to co-found one laptop per child. Um, and I architected um, this, the $100 laptop, as the chief technology officer of one laptop per child and the chief architect. And I actually, everybody thought this, this thing, millions of kids now have this all over, all over the world, Africa, South America, 50 different countries, 26 different languages, millions of them have them because children in the developing world don't have access to the kind of education that you guys do. We literally throw away half the children that are born in the world and that they don't get what any of us would consider to be an education. And so I thought using technology we could do something about that. And that really catalyzed a lot of further efforts. Uh, there's a Chromebook that's come out for $200 just this week. There's a $40 tablet that's just started shipping in in India, so there's a lot of different solutions, and we were part of that. 
Um, so it was really bizarre for me to start that company coming off of making multi-million dollar display systems. But I just, you learn to roll up your sleeves and figure different things out. So at the end of, of uh, getting, getting this laptop into mass production, a lot of the CEOs of the big manufacturers in Asia came to me wanting the low power management system in here and the screen technology that I invented. And so I thought, hmm, the name of our organization is One Laptop Per Child, not Let's Sell Advanced Components in the IT Infrastructure of Asia. But yeah, I realized, wow, while we were focused on the bottom of the pyramid, if we can make more of something, why not make it cheaper? And you know, my mother thought I was nuts for doing this. I left MIT where I was a professor, which is a pretty good school, and um, I guess number one these days, um, to do this. And I just thought there weren't enough MIT professors sleeping on the factory floors of the world, learning how stuff really is made, how the decisions are made, and how stuff is made to really create innovative things using that infrastructure. So that's what we're doing now, transforming basically all kinds of devices from cell phones, laptops, tablets, TVs. They're pretty much just the screen and the motherboard is going away. Screens and radios that power themselves, that see, feel, touch, and react um, using as is excess capacity of the world. So I'm pretty excited about that because I think the next wave of of computing actually was spurred through innovation from the developing world where the reason we, one of the key things about this is um, there aren't, there isn't power in the, there aren't electrical, electrical outlets in most of the developing world or where they are, they're not on all the time. And so you actually have to figure out if you're trying to make a computer device, how to make it just sip power so it can self charge or a small solar panel can recharge it. That's useful up and down the chain and that's what we're doing now. Right now it's, uh, you know, it takes seven hours to recharge an iPad. That's two days of solar time if there's clouds. It's just ridiculous. And so innovation is thought to come from the top end, but in fact, in the developing world, they have problem ownership that allows innovation to come from the bottom of the pyramid. And I'm just really excited about that. So thank you for having me today. And